Stop teaching high frequency words through memorization. If you're doing it this way, you're doing a disservice to your young learners. Let's jump into this. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Anna DiGilio. I was a primary teacher for 23 years. And on this channel, we dive into all things literacy. Today, we are going to demystify the world of early literacy and high frequency words. We're tackling a very controversial topic sometimes that's often misinterpreted, even in research-based reading instruction settings, teaching high frequency words. These are words that your kindergartners, even your first graders, and even your second graders will encounter most often. And how we teach them could really set the stage for their lifelong relationship with reading. And you might think that memorizing these words is the way to go, but honestly, it's a huge mistake one that I did myself, so I'm right in there with you. Instead, we should be focusing on the spelling patterns within these words to help our students decode them, just like any other word. This method not only aligns with the science of reading research, but it also makes learning more engaging and effective, which is most important. So stick around and I'm going to show you how to revolutionize the way you teach high frequency words to your young learners. Okay, let's jump into four strategies on how to effectively teach high frequency words to your kindergartners or even your first graders. First up, let's talk about how we organize our high frequency words. It's really important to organize them by their sounds. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. How is this going to work? Well, let me tell you, it's easier than you think. And honestly, it's incredibly effective. So imagine you're focusing on the long E sound for the week. You could focus on the open syllable type or the CV syllable. You could introduce high frequency words like she, he, or we. Or let's say you're working on digraphs. Then you can focus on the words like this, that, and then. You see where I'm going with this? What this does is actually phenomenal. It not only helps kids recognize these high frequency words, but it also reinforces the phonological patterns that they're learning. It's like hitting two birds with one stone. I hate that saying. So next time you're planning your high frequency word work instruction, think about how you can group these words by their sounds. Trust me, your kids will not only pick these words up faster, but they'll also become sound detective superstars. I promise you. Okay, let me just show you what I mean. If you see here on the screen, these are 109 most common high frequency words. These 109 words are crucial for students to learn very early on. Honestly, I would love all kindergartners to learn these 109 words. Most kindergartners learn anywhere between 50 and 75 high frequency words in a year, but I really believe learning these 109 will be instrumental in students learning how to read much more quickly. Again, not through memorization, but through these activities that I'm gonna show you today. Number one, organizing by these sounds, as you can see. So what you can see is we've organized them by different concepts or by different sounds or phoneme groups. So you can see we've got the C be in that first column, the and, at, as, if, right? We've got those closed, those closed syllables, right? Then we've got CVC words there, which also have some interesting pieces there because we've got find and long and most that have some blends at the end are still considered a CVC word, right? Even though it's got that blend at the end. Also, we've got words with all digraphs. So any word with a digraph, like we have back and much, which and when, that, then, this. So organizing your 109 most common high frequency words like this is a great way of teaching them. The reason why we have some on here that are red and some that aren't, red words are always irregular. Whether or not you teach explicitly or not, they always will be irregular because they have irregular sounds. But it's a great way to organize your high frequency words and teach them this way. In my opinion, and honestly, through research, students will learn them quickly if they're organized by skill and by phonic sound or by syllable type. They will learn them more quickly. So this is a great strategy of how to teach high frequency words by organizing through strategy or sound or syllable type. It's a great way to learn it. So that was strategy number one, organizing your high frequency words by, again, syllable type, phonic sound, etc. Okay, let's jump into strategy number two. Let's get 
touchy-feely with a multi-sensory approach. Children learn best when they can see and touch and hear. So why limit them to just using visual words, right? We want to use different types of activities that give them a tactile experience with high-frequency words. We could use sandpaper to do a tactile experience of sandpaper letters by tracing them and they trace them. We could use salt or sugar or flour by tracing them in that type of material or substance to give them that tactile feeling. This really gives them kind of like a full bodied experience around each word. An easy way to add in a tactile experience for high frequency words are getting these little Rubbermaid bins. And what I do is I put a little sugar or flour in there and they can trace the word we, we, and they trace it with their fingers. It's a tactile experience. If you don't want this, and to be honest, I like that it's deep because then it doesn't come out. So you make five or six of these and keep them at your reading table and it's really easy and they don't go anywhere. And this is just a great multi-sensory tactile approach to learning high frequency words. Another way of doing more of a tactile approach is by having students trace it. So let's say the high frequency word is two. We could just trace it on a tracing mat like this. So this is another great way using dry erase markers. Another thing you could do with a high frequency work mat like this with the word on it is you could use modeling clay. Now all of these activities take a little bit longer to do, but for students that really need that kinesthetic approach, it's really a great way to teaching some of these words that maybe they're, they're stuck on or they just can't master. Bringing in a multi-sensory approach will help them. You could do arm spelling. Arm spelling is just tapping their arm for the letters. So like when you say two, you go T-O. So you could tap, they call that arm spelling. You could also do sky writing, T-O. They write in the sky. So these are all different types of kinesthetic and tactile experiences students can use to really take hold and really master those high frequency words. Using a multi-sensory approach is another strategy to really getting your students to master those high frequency words. All right, let's jump into the third strategy. Hold on to your hats because this one's a game changer. Phoneme graphing mapping. So have you ever thought of teaching high frequency words like a puzzle? Well, this is your chance to do it. Phoneme graphing mapping is all about breaking the words down into their individual sounds and then mapping those sounds to their corresponding letter or letter groups. Let's take the word was, for example. The sounds in the word was are uh, z. So let's talk about how we are going to teach that through phoneme graphic mapping. Let me get my word mapping paddles out. So uh, this is just a great way of teaching high frequency words through phoneme graphic mapping. I also have a full blown video on this. It goes into a lot more detail on phoneme graphic mapping. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a very simple, very quick phoneme graphic mapping activity. So as I said, let's talk about the word was. You say to the students, friends, let's tap out the sounds in the word was. W uh, z. Let's do it again. W uh, z. Was. How many sounds do you hear in the word was? We hear three. We bring up three discs. What I love about the map its paddles is that you can do this whole group because if you got each kid with a magnetic paddle like this, it is easy peasy lemon squeezy to do phoneme graphy mapping. So this is great as a whole class activity. You could do this, take five words a day, three words a day, and do a very quick five minute phoneme graphy mapping activity before lunch and recess or before specials. It's great. Kids can keep these in their desk. They can keep the little magnets in their pencil boxes and they always have it by their desk. It's so easy to do. And again, because it's magnetic, you can see it if you're up in the front of the room. It's just great. So let's get back to was. So was, we've got three sounds. Now we'll say, okay, friends, what is the first sound you hear in the word was? We hear w, w. What letter or grapheme makes the w sound or represents the w sound? W. So we bring this up, we go w, and then we write the W here. So now we have w. Now was is a tough one because we've got 
two irregular parts in the word was. We've got a schwa sound because the A does not make the A sound, it makes the schwa sound. And we have the S making the Z sound. So we've got two irregular parts here. Now, maybe they already learned that S can make the Z sound and maybe they haven't. So you might have to walk them through this a little bit more if they haven't learned that skill yet or that lesson where S makes two sounds, S and Z. So if they haven't learned it yet, this will be new. So we'll say, okay, what is that other, what's the next sound? The second sound in the word was. We hear uh, uh, uh. Okay, well, what letter makes the uh sound? Now, they might say you, and you'd say, you're right, the letter U does make the uh sound, but you want to know what? All of the vowels, A, E, I, O, N, U, make the uh sound. It's called a schwa. Can you say schwa? Now, you're going to want to do a much deeper lesson on the schwa sound because it is in so many words. I don't have the exact percentage, but I want to say it's probably anywhere between 50 and 60% of the time vowels have a schwa sound. I have to look up that exact number in research, but it is a lot. The vowels make the schwa sound a lot of the times. So we could say, well, yes, in most, in most words that uh is a U, but all the vowels make the uh sound. It's called the schwa. So in this one, we have uh, actually it's the A that makes the uh sound in this word. That's called a schwa sound. Again, you're going to want to do a full blown lesson on this. What's the last sound we hear in the word was? We hear z. Okay, let's z. We move it up. What letter represents or says the z sound? They might say z. I had my students writing was forever with that z. And we say, yes, the z does make the z sound. You, but you want to know what? There, and we show them, this is not right. That's not how to spell the word was. Also, the letter s makes the z sound also like the word was and is and his. Give them other words so they can say, oh wow, is does have that z sound. His does have that z sound. So bring up other words as well that have that same sound. So this is phoneme graphy mapping. Again, you can do three to five words in less than five minutes like this. And then they say was, say it again was. Give them a sentence with the word was in it, okay? I was happy yesterday. A simple sentence. Give them the word. Phoneme graphing map the word. Use the word in a sentence. Have them say the word. Point out the irregular parts. And another point with this is that these are irregular sounds because they don't follow the typical English code. So because they're irregular, we say we need to learn these parts by heart because they're not regular. So these are the parts we learn by heart because they're irregular. So we practice them, we phoneme graphy map them, we say this is the heart part because we have to learn it by heart. And that's how you do heart words when you're doing phoneme graphy mapping. Again, this is a way you can do it. You could also do it on a whiteboard. However you want to do phoneme graphy mapping, it will work. And it's a great way of teaching high frequency words because the brain is mapping the graphemes, which are the letters, to the phonemes, which are the sounds. And it's connecting those letter chains in the brain. It is a brain function. It's called orthographic mapping. So what's happening as we're doing this, Orthographic mapping is happening in the brain. It's connecting those phonemes to graphemes and it's linking those word chains in the brain. So they could automatically be retrieved when we're reading. And that's what phoneme graphy mapping does. It helps our brain orthographically map words so we could automatically retrieve them when we're reading. So that is another strategy for teaching high frequency words. Okay, the next strategy we're going to talk about is contextual teaching. Words don't live in isolation. They have neighbors and friends and families, just like we do. When we're teaching high frequency words, we don't just wanna flash a word at them on a flashcard and ask the students to repeat it over and over again. Instead, we should use them in sentences, in stories, in real life situations. For example, if you're teaching the high frequency word the, let's read a story that includes the word multiple times and have kids point it out. It's like teaching them to recognize a friend in a crowd. Trust me, the word will stick because they've seen it in kind of like their natural habitat. Now imagine we've got a whiteboard in front of us. Let's use this one. So I've got a whiteboard in front of us. Let's take this off. And what we want to do is we want to talk about the word the. So we might want to teach them phoneme graphing uh, mapping of the word the. So on our high frequency word cards, we have the phoneme graphing mapping right on the back. So let's say we're teaching the high frequency word the. 
a great way when you want to practice a word that maybe the students are having trouble with is have them dictate some sentences to you as you write them. But there's one part that might really solidify this, and I'm going to tell you what it is. So you'll say to the students, who can give me a sentence with the word the or using the word the? So maybe one of the students raises their hand and they say, the cat is big. So I'm going to write the cat is big. Now, I'm either doing this on a whiteboard or I'm doing it on chart paper. I used to love doing this type of activity on chart paper because then I would put it up and I'd hang it up in the classroom. The best part about it is you put their name next to it. So let's say, you know, Timmy said this one. So I would write Timmy's name in parentheses in a different color. When students see their name up a whiteboard, I don't know, they just have this feeling about it. It's like they have ownership of it. Like, wow, look what I did. My name is up there. It's an incredible strategy that I used all the time in my classroom. And my students loved it. They'd see their name all over the place in the classroom, especially when we created anchor charts or things like that. It's just a great way in giving students ownership and making them feel proud of their work. So maybe another student says, I have the paper. So... The other student said that, you write their name. This is, let's say, Sally, and you write Sally's name next to it. This is contextual teaching, using words in sentences, seeing them and using them in stories, writing them down, practicing them, using them in context. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about contextual teaching. It's a, just a great way of connecting that word. It might be a word that many students are having trouble with. This might be one specific word that students aren't getting. Was, in the last part that I gave you, was, was one of those words where 90% of my students had trouble with this one. Or the word of. How many of your students wrote the word of with UV? So there's always those words that could use more practice and teaching it contextually will really help them. And then maybe circling it or underlining it or making a, a squiggly line around it will really cement it in their head. They've seen it. They are using it. They're using it in context. They see it up on the chart paper. You're practicing it. You're seeing it in books. They're pointing it out in books. It's just a great way to practice high frequency words. So by teaching them contextually, you're not just teaching the word in isolation and just showing them a word. You're showing them how it functions in a sentence. The students start to see these words as a useful tool and not just a chore to memorize. All right, so there you have it. We've explored four game-changing strategies to effectively teach high-frequency words to your kindergartners or your first graders without relying on rote memorization. From using real-world context to stories to phoneme graphene mapping and even categorizing words by their sounds, these approaches can revolutionize how you teach your students to learn these high-frequency words. But guess what? This is just the tip of the iceberg. If you found this video useful, you're going to want to dive deeper into my channel. I've also got something special for you down below in the description. I have a free phoneme graphene mapping mat with a directions trifold to get you started on phoneme graphene mapping with your students. So definitely click that link below to grab your freebie and stay tuned for our next videos where we'll dive even further into maximizing your literacy instruction in your classroom. And if you've got value out of this video, please hit that little notification bell so you are alerted whenever my new videos go live. Thank you again for watching. I hope you got some value out of this video and I will see you in the next video. Happy teaching.